Matthew 28, we'll be reading verses 16 through 20. The end is near. We're going to read verses 16 through 20. <clears throat> Now that you've all gotten settled, let's stand again, and let's give our hearts attention to the Word of God. Matthew 28, verse 16, this is God's holy Word. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Amen. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. We come to thee, almighty God, for thou alone art God. All the gods of the nations are but idols, demon-inspired fiction, works of the flesh. Eyes have they, but they cannot see. Ears have they but they cannot hear those that make them and those that worship them are like them. O Christ, thou didst purpose to shatter that darkness by sending thy apostles into the world and by sending us to our homes, our neighborhoods, our cities, our nation, to other nations. Doubt its purpose for the one true living God to be made manifest to the world. That the day might come and is a day closer. when all the nations of this world will bow to Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. Oh, dear God. That the politicians and magistrates of this country from the highest to the lowest order, would bow to the King of Kings. Almighty and righteous God, we stand before Thee, weak and feeble vessels, limited, but those that have been granted the blessing, the miracle of a new heart. We feel the foulness of remaining sin. It's assaults upon our mind, our heart, our emotions. O oh Christ, ruler of all nations, ruler of every child of God, Come as the Prince of Peace this morning and subdue our hearts. Whatever our frame when we walked in the door, mountaintop joy or the valley of the shadow of death, draw all hearts here to thee. Thou wert lifted up 
that thou wouldst draw all thy people to thee. Lord, I pray that thou wouldst give this feeble vessel the ability to set thee before, before the hungry hearts of the saved and the darkened and enslaved hearts of the lost. And that all of us would be drawn by the great magnet of thy love to magnify thee, to glorify thee, to worship and adore thee. O Christ, O fountain of life, make thy presence known this morning. Convict of sin, grant repentance, fill with joy unspeakable and full of glory. May thy spirit come and deal with us where we are and turn our eyes upon thee that we might look and look and continue to look until that day thou dost return for us. Fairest Christ, blessed and holy one, how we pray thou would show thy mercy to the lost this very day. Father, there are some who've heard hundreds of times the blessed name of Christ and have heard that he receives sinners and remain stubbornly in their sin. O oh God, have mercy on them this very day. Break the chains of their sins and lusts. Shine the light of thy glorious gospel into their darkened hearts. Expose sin and show Christ as the only remedy. O oh Lord Jesus, may thy people feast upon thee today. May we feast upon thee. Lord Jesus, thou art so pure, so holy, so good, so gracious, so merciful. How we long for thee to move in our hearts. Thou didst promise rivers of living waters. Make it so today. May those mighty waters flow from our hearts in prayer, praise, adoration, genuine love for thee and for one another. May we have a taste of heaven here, Lord. And now, oh God, help me as I try to preach this word. It is infallible and I am fallible. It is light, and I am darkness apart from thee. It is truth. Please do not let me mishandle it. Lord, I pray that thou wouldst remove anything that would smell of sinful anger fleshly harshness. Condescension. And help me to preach Christ. In thy name, O blessed Savior. Meet with us now. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. In the final paragraph of his spirit-inspired gospel, Matthew does not tell us the name of the mountain in Galilee upon which Jesus met with the eleven, what time of day it was, 
or any other details. That makes one thing exceptionally clear. The Holy Spirit is focusing our attention on Jesus and his message. That's all that matters. In part two of this sermon, we considered the term Great Commission. The word great is a word of comparison. It means more magnitude than something else. And commission means delegated authority to act in some specified manner. And the Lord Jesus Christ has told his disciples the specified manner. Make disciples. The Great Commission, therefore, is great because it comes from the greatest authority in the universe. It is startling in its worldwide scope. And it is eternal in its consequences for immortal souls. King Jesus authorized his disciples to make disciples in all the nations of the world. Now we learned that because of Jesus' universal authority, he could rightfully command, go ye therefore and disciple the nations. And there are three characteristics of that discipling. Going, baptizing, and teaching. We considered the surprising fact that Matthew's commission does not mention the gospel, but Mark and Luke's commissions do. So the focus of the Great Commission, as recorded in this text, is Jesus's command to make disciples in all the nations of the world. And the other commissions tell us how. We get that? I didn't get that. Could you try again? The Great Commission is not about decisions. The Great Commission is about disciples. That's two different projects. If we don't understand that, we're not understanding the scriptures well, and we are believing the nonsense that comes out of many pulpits. By preaching the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus the God-man, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we make disciples. We are then to baptize them and to teach them to obey Jesus. So we now return to discipling the world for King Jesus, part three. May the blessed triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Pour out the mighty blessings of grace, mercy, and love that we so desperately need. May we love the Father for purposing our salvation. May we love the Son for accomplishing our salvation. May we love the Holy Spirit for empowering us, applying that salvation to us, that we might love God and love his people. And may we love that spirit for granting us understanding in the infallible word. We need that this morning. Oh, bless his holy name forevermore. We have one main heading, and it's this. Jesus the king authorized his disciples to baptize all disciples worldwide. Do we believe that? 
Are those just words on a page? Or have we heard the king's command and are we about pursuing and fulfilling it? Are we just pusters? Are we just sermon hearers? Or are we Christ obeyers? This is a command from the king. This is not the kind of thing that we sit down and say, well, I wonder who's going to do that. It's, since you're the king, since you've made that command, how do you want me to do that? Not only were the 11 disciples to disciple the nations, they were to set those disciples apart from everyone else in the world. How? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the first thing for us to consider is that Jesus commanded all disciples everywhere to be baptized. This is not an option. The one with all authority in heaven and earth has said, you're to be baptized if you're my disciple. As we've seen in an earlier message, the beautiful Christology that the Holy Spirit set forth in this passage touches every aspect of Jesus' great commission. Our lovely King Jesus who announced that he had all authority in heaven and in earth, stood upon the mountain in Galilee and commanded his disciples to make disciples worldwide and to baptize them. Baptism, then, is necessary. Baptism doesn't save us, but it is necessary Because the king of the universe demands it. That simple. We can have all the theological debates that we want, but the fact of the matter is we need to be giving ourselves to fulfilling, obeying heartily, cheerfully, joyfully that command. The New Testament knows nothing of unbaptized believers with the one exception of the thief on the cross, who's always brought into the discussion. He at least proves to us that we're not saved by baptism. He was with Christ that day in paradise. Now, what was Jesus commanding his disciples and us to do when he says baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and of the holy ghost what is it exactly that he's commanding us to do that should be easy for most of us to answer though it it might not be we hope to dispel anything unclear in your thinking about that so what is it that he wants us to do and to answer that we must begin by answering This question, what is baptism? In our day, that is not an easily answered question. The only agreement among most denominations of professing Christians is that baptism is a water rite, R-I-T-E, rite, an established ceremony. Yet, Salvation Army and Quakers do not believe in water baptism. They teach that the passages addressing baptism are about spirit baptism. Well, they have an argument. The very fact of the matter is a number of places that speak of our being baptized with careful study do yield the idea that it is the spirit baptism spoken of in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We are all baptized into one body by the spirit. So, 
they would say all we need to be is baptized by the Spirit. That's the only requirement that we have from Christ here. So we go all the way from um, water baptism to a combination to spirit baptism. What is it that Jesus was commanding? <clears throat> of course, I stand with those who would say that it is a water rite that he has commanded us to take part in. But the chasm of disagreement among prof, uh, professing Christians is wide. It, it's very much like the Lord's Supper. It's hard to find groups that agree on virtually any aspect of the ordinances Christ has given to his church. It does make sense to us, does it not, that Satan would do everything he can to destroy the worship of Christ, destroy the means of grace by which his people engage him and bring him glory. So this is not a little matter. I hear Christians all the time saying, ah, well, you know, we're not saved by baptism. It's not a big deal. When the king of the universe commands that it be done, I would say it's a misreading of the text. To say it's not a big deal. Who should be baptized? Depends on who you ask. When should baptism be administered? Depends on who you ask. What is the mode of baptism? A mode, children, is how you do something. How you do something. Well, those questions must be answered. Now, as we enter a brief discussion of the ordinance of baptism so that we might be clear on what our king is commanding, we must first consider two terms, two terms, credo baptism and pedo baptism. That's on your outline so you don't have to scribble in a hurry. I want you to stay paying attention. Credo baptism and pedo baptism. The debates between credo baptist and pedo baptist are many, ancient, complex, and far too often hostile. We do not presently have time to unravel all the arguments that have developed over the centuries. And anybody that thinks this is a simple matter hasn't engaged the arguments. However, the term credo in credo baptist is from the Latin, I believe. Therefore, credo baptism means believer's baptism. We are credo baptists. We believe that the infallible word of God teaches the baptism of disciples only. In other words, believer's baptism is the practice of immersing disciples in water, which we might call more accurately believer immersion. We believe in believer immersion. A few credo Baptists pour water on the believer. Uh, we think they're wrong, but we have to acknowledge their practice. They, of course, believe that we're in error. The Baptist theologian James Pettigrew Boyce gives us the simplest definition. It is the immersion of the body in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The immersion of the body in water in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. On the other hand, the term pedo is the Latin infant or child. Pedo baptism is the practice of sprinkling infants with water. 
Although, as with credo Baptists, <clears throat> there are some pedo Baptists who pour water on infants. That's called affusion, by the way. <clears throat> or they even immerse them. To our surprise. Having said that, the words baptism and baptize. Now, you're going to have to buckle up for just a minute. We're going to do a little technical thing here. I know some of you immediately glaze over. <laughs> Unglaze. Hey, let, let's walk through this technical thing for just a moment. If you'll stay with me, I think you'll find it profitable. <clears throat> I try not to do this often. Having said what I've just said about credo Baptist and pedo Baptist, the words baptism and baptize are English transliterations of the Greek words bapto and baptizo. Bapto and baptizo. You can hear it, right? Baptism right there in those words. Now, why does that matter? Well, <clears throat> Yeah, we're, we're always having to dig down under the surface and try to understand what's actually going on when people start disagreeing about things. <clears throat> Baptism and baptize are English transliterations of the Greek words. Now, the difference between a transliteration and a translation is this. I'm going to try to make this as simple as I can, which might make it awful, but I'm going to do my best. And the idea here is that when we come from a, an original, a resource language into another language, when we're translating, we're taking the idea here, we're taking the word and the idea, and we're coming over into a receptor language, and we're, we're trying to find in our language what words are equivalent to this that carry the same sense, okay? A translation, for instance, would be the word bread. In French, it's pain. You've got to have a good nasal passage to say that well. Pain, all right? Pain and bread don't sound the same. Pain is the French word for it. Bread is the English word for it, right? So we translate one into the other because it carries the sense. That's translation, all right? The fact is not all languages have equivalents in the other language, all right? Sometimes uh, we really have to stretch. When I was a, a child, and I, I had a Saturday morning uh, show that I used to watch uh, uh, fervently every week. And in between times, in Lafayette in those days, uh, you would hear people speaking, speaking Cajun French all the time. And um, so I grew up hearing Cajun French. And there would always be a car advertisement. And he'd be rolling along in his Cajun French. I didn't understand any of the words until he'd come right along to just about the end of the advertisement and then say, air condition, white wall tire. <laughs> I'd say, I got it. I, well, I know that part. I, I, I know what air conditioning is. Uh -huh. All right. <clears throat> they didn't have exactly a term for that at that time. So they would just go over and use the English. All right. Now, I have to bring up now a, 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 a principle. And you need, to, you need to recognize this. Because every, every language uh, does not have exactly the same kinds of ideas, idioms, the way they structure the sentences. <clears throat> All translation is interpretation. That's hard for us to get a hold of. Some of us that have been in the battles for the, the Bible translations have to realize the reality of it. Sometimes there just simply aren't in some languages an equivalent, uh, equivalent expression. I, I learned this in, with great power when I was preaching in South America. I was preaching along and, and the brother that was interpreting for me, man, I mean, he was getting into it. He was preaching it. And I'd preach, and he'd preach, and I'd preach, and he'd preach, and I'd preach. And then he, he stopped, and he looked at some of the uh, older brothers uh, and older pastors that were sitting in the front row, and he said, um, 
How do I say that? How, how, would, how would we say that? And they all looked at each other and talked for a few minutes. And, and they gave him something that came close to an equivalent. I mean, we all think that, oh, all the languages out there are just English with different spelling. <laughs> right? And, and all of their languages uh, are, uh, you know, they, we've all got a word for word. You know, by the way, most of the time when you're hearing these companies selling you Bibles and saying it's word for word, it's like, no, it's just reaching into your pocket. Because I mean, all, all, all translation is interpretation. Transliteration is different. Transliteration is reaching into the original language and putting... Uh, English letters to it and just bringing it over into English. You're not translating anything. You're taking that word and you're putting English letters with it. There are a number of reasons for doing transliterations. But that's exactly what the translators of the authorized version did. They were Anglicans and Puritans. There was not one Baptist among them. It's an interesting part of history that most of the people that, that tend to defend the authorized version today are Baptist, all of which were despised by the Anglicans in those days. They didn't translate that Bible quote for us. And very often we misread them because we're not Anglicans or Puritans. That's a fact. Now, what we're, what we're doing here is we're coming down to this idea of baptism. If you're following me, these Anglican and Puritan scholars, and they were world-class. They were world-class scholars in those days. They all practiced infant sprinkling, every one of them but they were also honest. They knew that baptizo means immerse, to plunge, to wash, to immerse, plunge under, dip. They knew that. They knew that baptizo was not rantizo, which means sprinkle. So they couldn't, with a good conscience, say, um, when Jesus sprinkled or when John the Baptist sprinkled, or they couldn't say that. So they transliterated it. They just took the word, that means immerse, and brought it over into the English language, transliterating it, just putting English letters to it, B-A-P-T-I. Okay? Yeah, are you with me on that? Is that... Okay, if you understand that, it's one of the reasons that we have debates about baptism. The word itself means immerse. In fact, there have been translations of the Bible that have uh, laid aside the transliteration and, and put dip or immersion in every one of those places. That's what it means. But when you take it and transliterate it, you can make it a theological football. <clears throat> right? You can do that. You can, you can say what you want to say about the word because it becomes a theological term <laughs> rather than just the word that's in the text. Now, some of our, our, our pedo-baptist friends would be screaming at this moment and, and saying that I'm simplifying this too much. And that's what happens when you try to simplify things. These are big discussions. They are long discussions. They are wearying debates. And as I said, sometimes they're hostile. You don't want to be hostile in any of this. <clears throat> so the translators, the good Anglican and Puritan infant sprinklers carried the word over and transliterated it. So, 
Even the pedo-baptist John Calvin acknowledged in his institutes, quote, but whether the person being baptized should be wholly immersed or whether thrice or once, whether he should only be sprinkled with poured water, these details are of no importance. Well, at least they weren't to John. But ought to be optional to churches according to the diversity of countries. Yet, the word baptize means to immerse. Calvin himself. The word baptize means to immerse, and it is clear that the rite of immersion was observed in the ancient church. Close quote. I appreciate that kind of honesty in a theologian. <clears throat> now, even though the pedo-baptist Calvin could acknowledge that, many of those who have remained in the pedo-baptist tradition um, have come actually to argue that immersion shouldn't even be in the picture, that it's only sprinkling or pouring. And we're not going to deal with any of that today. <clears throat> Here's what I would have us move to. <clears throat> the word baptize means, generally speaking, to immerse. The Greek Orthodox Church, if you're drifting, this is the time you want to come back. All right? The Greek Orthodox Church, which clearly understands the Greek of the New Testament, says, quote, the very word or name of this mystery, meaning baptism, in the language initially used by the enlightened apostles to communicate the good news of the gospel to us actually means immersion, not pouring or sprinkling. Close quote. Because the Greek Orthodox are pedobaptists, they immerse their infants entirely. Right? <clears throat> so while we would disagree with them on the subjects of immersion, who is baptized, we can agree with them about the mode. It's their language. They, they speak modern Greek. You, have to, you still have to go back and, and know the older Greek. But they understand the Greek. They understand their language. <clears throat> so, we understand in this congregation and others like it to teach credo-baptism. The baptism, the immersion of believers, of disciples only. Every passage in the New Testament that deals with baptism always involves disciples. Never infants. It doesn't exist. With that in mind, it is important for us to follow Jesus' thinking here. Listen carefully. He says, make disciples. That's the main verb. And then there are three characteristics of that making disciples going baptizing and teaching so <clears throat> he says make disciples which is the focus of the commission baptizing them baptizing whom baptizing the disciples made that's the way the grammar falls out. It doesn't matter what language you're looking at. The Greek here is, uh, well, we would say it was clear, but men with uh, degrees in, in Greek and Hebrew make um, different comments about that. <clears throat> but baptizing the disciples that have been made, which means the immersion of those who have been made disciples, those who repent and believe on the crucified and resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. So we're taking all of this time to say and to answer the question, what did Jesus tell us to do? 
because we're not all doing the same thing. We understand actually the simpler view. It means immerse. We immerse. Who do we immerse? We immerse those who repent and believe because that's the order Jesus gave us. Make the disciples, baptize and teach them. That's the path, that's the, that's the path we follow. We find it arising directly from the text, even when in the English we have a transliterated word. So, <clears throat> by the way, in, in this very same discussion, we'll move from the technical in just a moment. For this very reason, the, the, uh, the authorized virgin translators translated the verb disciple with the verb teach. This is not the Greek word for teach. Why in the world did our Anglican and Puritan brethren put teach when the verb is, look it up, disciple? Why did they do that? Because all, all translation is interpretation. They were looking at this notion of a word that can be a, a, a verb, disciple somebody, or a noun, he is a disciple. They looked at it and they realized that how is it that we disciple? How do we make disciples? We teach them the gospel. That's not word for word, but it grasps the idea. That, do, do you see that? I don't want to lose you. Okay. So as we've seen, to disciple the nations means to make learners. And not only are we to make learners, we are then to baptize them. We're to mark them out as learners of Jesus Christ, about Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ. Sinners are not made disciples by baptism, which is what some teach. We do not hold that view. We cannot find that in the text underlying the English. <clears throat> so, discipling the nations... Me, it's exactly what you see in the entire book of Acts. Look at the connection. If you'll stop and think, look at Jesus with the 11 on the mountain and in his resurrected glory, in his beauty, he stands before them and he says, now you, you ran away, but I've restored you and I've got a task for you. Go disciple the world. Go make disciples. I've discipled you. Now you go and you disciple others. So this is how you do it. Going wherever you go. Then make the disciples by preaching the glories of the gospel, the power of God unto salvation. And then those that repent and believe need to be baptized, immersed in water, and then teach them to obey me. That's what Jesus is commanding. That's what he's commanding. This is how the world was conquered for Jesus in the days of the apostles. Just look at the Acts and read it. If you read Matthew 28 over and over and over this part, read the commission in Luke, read the commission in Mark, read the commission in John, and then read the book of Acts, and you will see the men that he commissioned going out and doing precisely what he's saying right here. They went and made disciples preaching the glories of the crucified and resurrected Christ. Then they baptize those who profess repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, generally speaking, there are a few exceptions, they stayed with them and they made communities called 
churches. That's what missions are about. We love and we appreciate anybody that takes time out of their life to go into another nation, another country, uh, and, and to uh, drill wells and, and rebuild buildings that were destroyed in hurricanes and all of those kinds of things and doing it in the name of Christ. That's wonderful work. That's wonderful Christian work. It's not what Jesus is talking about here. If that work doesn't open the door to preach the gospel and make disciples, it's not a mission in the sense that it's being spoken of here. Okay. I'm not trying to attack anybody, not trying to attack anybody's desire to help. Christians, of course, want to help. Wonderful. Man, go as often as you can. Take doctors, fix up bodies. Go around the nation and do good. Go around the world and do good in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what Jesus is commissioning is making disciples. If you're going to rebuild somebody's house as a way to sit down and tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah go. One of the reasons missions have fallen on hard times is because we're not doing what Jesus commands. What you see throughout the book of Acts, especially with Paul and Peter, is going and preaching the gospel and taking the disciples and beginning to teach them about what it means to walk under King Jesus. The enemy of our souls is always trying to undo everything that Jesus said. Every action, every motion, everything that he said. If, if he cannot destroy our testimony, he'll do everything he can to befoul our doctrine. You're in a battle. Do you know what your king is commanding you to do? That's powerful, isn't it? I've given myself to work sometimes and worked myself to the bone, found out I was doing the wrong thing. That's not encouraging. I don't want to do that from a pulpit. Jesus is commanding us some very specific things here. And the traditions of men, misunderstandings, the attacks of the enemy, there are all kinds of reasons why there's so much confusion about everything that Christ has said. But it behooves us to get down and dig in it. Young people, I can't press you enough. You're not married yet. Your time to study is going to evaporate. Wake up and realize what you need to be doing with your time right now is learning your Christ. Learning who he is. Learning how to defend his faith. Walking with him understanding what he's commanded so that when your husbands and wives you can actually disciple them You're, when you have children don't waste your time don't waste your time God help us especially in the day we're living in we need an army of people that can say, I know who Jesus is. I know what he's done to save sinners. And I know what he wants me to do. I know what he wants me to be as a man. I know what he wants me to be as a woman. I mean, the most fundamental things in our lives are being completely destroyed in front of us. We need to get down and make sure we're understanding what we're being commanded to do. Go and disciple the nations. Disciple. We'll go further in that in just a few moments. But make disciples. And then what do you see Paul doing? Forming them into churches. Appointing elders. Why? That's God's 
purpose in Christ. I will build my church. That's how he takes over the nations of the world. Do you not understand that? That's the king advancing. That's the one on the white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth. He's going out to conquer. Conquering and conquer. What? The darkness. Following their profession of faith in Christ. You will find throughout the book of Acts. The disciples baptizing the disciples they've made. You will see them preaching and teaching the gospel. It's wonderful. I mean, it's just, it will renew your understanding when you read the book of Acts through Matthew 28. You will see faithful men believing and uh, obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. So, make disciples, baptize them, teach them to walk with Jesus. That's what you find in the rest of the Bible. Why do you think Paul was writing letters? Do you understand that the Gospels are like the womb out of which the baby, the book of Acts, begins? The churches of the Lord Jesus Christ come out of what happened when Jesus the resurrected said go. It started changing the world. It started changing everything in history. Mighty Rome within centuries fell and collapsed. Christianity kept right on going. Satan used Rome to do everything it could to stamp out the people of God. And that mindset is still in this country. But we go because we love our enemies, because we don't want them to burn in hell forever. We want to tell them the glories of his saving Christ. We baptize them and teach them to walk with Jesus. We don't just get some marks on our belt. Yeah, man, you know, 40,000 people have come to Christ because of me. You know, I mean, I've had enough of that kind of religion Can you find any of them? Do you know where any of them are? Are they walking with Jesus? Make disciples. That's, that's why we have the rest of the New Testament literature. Walk with Jesus. Why do you think Paul always plants the cross in the middle of his arguments? Why do you think he's constantly pointing to the blood of Christ? Why do you think he's constantly pointing to the glory of Jesus Christ? He's building the church. He's building the church that Jesus found it. It's going to go through the whole world. Whether we get up and go or not. Jesus is going to accomplish everything infinitely necessary to advance his kingdom. And then in the day of judgment when he ushers in the glory and the beauty of eternity. We'll see that Sometimes our most feeble efforts in trying to honor the Lord Jesus brought him glory. We're used of him in saving a soul. Some Calvinists deserve all the heat they get because they ice over. God's going to get his elect. You're in trouble the minute you start thinking. No, no. How, how does the elect come in? We take the gospel. He has ordained all the means. He's ordaining them right here. Oh, my dear friends, my brothers, my sisters, and oh, lost ones. Consider, what do you see in John the Baptist? What did you see in John the Baptist? John came on the scene preaching. Repent ye. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
The king is coming. The kingdom is going to be established. Do you think they believed that? A few people did. But not the nation as a whole. That's why God destroyed them in AD 70. Ash heap. Gone. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The people of the surrounding regions were baptized of John in Jordan, confessing their sins. What do we see here? Disciples. People that are confessing their sins. They're hearing what he's preaching and they're saying, yes, I'm a sinner. I need the pardon of sins. And they waded out into the water and that wild man put them under. Inspired, but I mean, can't. do you sit and think about what you're reading? I mean, there are times when I have to get a hold of my imagination. I understand that. But do you think about it? Think about it. Think about a man out there, you know, in his skin robe, who's eating bugs and commanding everybody to repent. What would that look like in the newspaper tomorrow? I mean, hey, you want to go out and see the character who's in the Gulf? He's yelling at everybody that goes by. I mean, get real. They weren't saying, oh, what a wonderful guy. But there were some people that were hearing what he was saying. And they walked out into the water and he immersed them because they said, I'm an adulterer. I'm a liar. I'm a fornicator. I'm a thief. They're confessing their sins. Man, what would that look like in Pensacola? Mercy. I mean, he's, I mean, God gave him a hard job. But God was being faithful to what he promised. He was introducing Christ. That's what he was there to do. But on the way to Christ... Those that heard him were the ones that went under the water. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul explained John's baptism this way. This is in Acts chapter 19. John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people, now listen carefully, saying unto the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is, on Christ Jesus. That's what John was about. John wasn't out there just start, at starting his own movement. We're the Johnists, right? He wasn't out there starting his own deal. He was saying, look, look, do you see him? That's the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins of the world. And when those Ephesian disciples heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. They said, okay, we didn't exactly get that, but we've got it now. Baptize us. What were they? Disciples. Nobody's bringing infants, children, babies. It's disciples. So John's disciples were commanded to repent of their sins, to be baptized, confessing their sins, and to believe on the coming Christ. And what does that imply? No infants in John's baptism. Only people who were called to repent and did. Lots of people that are called. Some of you have been sitting here for years and have been called to repent in the mercies and the grace of Jesus Christ. You've seen your pastors weep for your immortal souls and you don't care. And some of you sit with a profession that would not break through this ceiling. And it will only be the flames of hell that will make you let go of that false religion. Christ saves. He saves. 
And it's because people hear the gospel and they come. And they come because they know they're sinners. And they find that Jesus is as merciful and as kind and as gracious and as merciful as he can be. He doesn't rail on them. Listen, John chapter 4, verse 1 and 2, the scripture says Jesus, uh, that, that Jesus was baptizing disciples. Uh, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not but his disciples, well, therefore, Jesus through his disciples, through his disciples, baptized only disciples. It's the same thing. Follow it all the way through. Read the Gospels. Read the book of Acts. You will not find anything but disciples. Disciples. For all the wonderful and intricate and remarkably uh, crafted arguments there are in all of this. Brethren, when you examine the scriptures, when baptism as we presently understand it was introduced... At the beginning, in the middle, and at the very end, it all points to disciples being baptized. I know some of my dear friends don't believe that. And they will think I'm too hard. Now, Jesus then, through his disciples, baptized. It was the disciples. You could keep reading Jesus commanded all disciples to show to the world that they belong to the living God. Hmm. The text reveals that King Jesus commanded his disciples not only to make disciples and immerse them, but to immerse them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Once again, the literal Greek underlying the English says, going or having traveled, therefore disciple the nations, make learners, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In his very helpful book, which we carry in our church bookstore. If, if you don't have this, you, you really, uh, you should. And in his very helpful book, The The Baptism of Disciples Alone, Fred Malone says, quote, here the idea is to dip or immerse disciples, not pour or sprinkle water, as the Greek Orthodox would agree, (laughs) into union with the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit as the body is dipped into union with water. Them, not water, is the direct object of baptize. Baptize them disciples. In the New Testament, only disciples are baptized or immersed by dipping them in or into water and into union with the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Close quote. It's not about just getting wet. I'm afraid for for many of us, that's it. You know, it's (laughs) it's the wet right and then it's over. You know, yeah, somebody obeyed Jesus. It's like, no, this is a holy act of worship. This is a holy act of worship where we watch someone obeying the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism then is the believer's testimony to the world that he or she belongs to, serves, or worships the one true living God revealed in the Bible. Do you realize that what you're saying? I always try to help everybody. I, 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 I usually preach a sermon on the day that we're baptizing about baptism because I want everybody to understand, look, this is not just about you know, looking at your friend and cheering. But if we really want to be serious about this, the only people to cheer is Christ, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You took another one from Satan. (laughs) Glory to God. Now that's what you want to rejoice about. Not just seeing your friends get wet or doing a, a religious thing that you did. Baptism is the believer's testimony to the world that you belong to God. 
Do you get that? Do I, do I get that? Thankfully, when I was rebaptized, that's another story altogether. But when, when the Lord actually converted me, I realized that when I walked the aisle in the fifth grade, I was as lost as a Hindu and I came up out of the water. But then I, sa I said to my, my pastor at the time, I said, I'm realizing I have never been baptized as on, on the profession of my repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus. Now, there would be guys today that would say, well, you know, now just live up to your baptism. Yeah, and that's fine. You know, you didn't know what you were doing then, but now you do. And so you, you have to do it. But I said, no, man, I want to go under in the name of Jesus Christ. And he put me down. And about this, about this much of my face didn't go under. And just as he started to pick me up, he realized it. And he pushed me back under. <laughs> I thought I was going to drown. <laughs> I was coming up for air. Man, boom, man, it was right back under. But the, the, point, the point that I'm wanting you to get is that it was like I wanted to be immersed in the name of Jesus Christ. And I was glad that, that when he saw that I wasn't entirely under, he was like, okay, here we go again. Boom. And I went down. I went down. That was my baptism. Now, what was I saying in that baptism? I'm Christ's. He bought me. I'm his. I'm dead with him. I'm alive with him. We have to go just a couple more minutes. This is too important to quit right now. I don't know how I always think I don't have enough, uh, enough sermon. And I ended up with enough for three. You're very patient. Now, what, what I want us, I want us to think about these things. I, 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 our applications, I'm going to come back and we're going to do the applications. But, but I want you to know that first and foremost in our applications, in love for King Jesus and submission to his supreme authority, let us make disciples. That's as practical an application of what we've just been reading as we can. Let's make disciples. Let's make disciples. Now, I, I had an entire developed application to talk about the different ways we might be able to do that. So I'm going to do that next week, God willing. All right? Because everybody thinks that the, the minute someone presses their conscience in something like this, that it's like, oh, you know, he wants me to go to the North Pole. Or, he, no, I want you to go wherever God wants you. You know, you don't, you don't have to go subterranean. Yeah, you don't. The, the point is, cast yourself like Paul in front of the, the, the risen Christ and say, Lord, what would you have me do? Amen. And do that. Amen. Go where he wants you to go. If he wants you to go to Russia, go to Russia. Now, our friends over in the, in, in the Far East right now are going through unbelievable times because they said, I want to go wherever Christ wants me to go. They're wondering if they're going to live. I hope with all my heart someone writes a book about them one of these days. But I'm going to tell you, brother, it's not going to be. It's not about whether it's fun. Is it holy? Is it what Christ is calling me to? Now, when we're young, especially, you know, we can think, oh, yeah, we're going to. I mean, I was in a youth group. And it, sorry, that probably sounded condescending. Let me back that up. I was in a youth group once, and in the youth group, uh, everybody, you know, we'd hear these messages, and everybody said, yes, I'm going to be a missionary. None of them ever went. When you're young, you think those things. It's kind of romantic. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about praying and fasting until God makes clear to you what he wants you to do. Amen. And rest assured, the enemy can send people in your life that'll do what they can to guide you in a different direction. A lot of times it comes in a pretty package. I mean, we'll talk about the various ways you can do this, whether you're at home, whether you're with your family, whether you are, you know, or whether the Lord is sending you to Russia, to Myanmar, to, to uh, China. Now, 
In love of Jesus Christ, number two, in submission to his supreme authority, let us baptize only those who repent and believe on the Lord Jesus. That's our marching orders. If you agree with what you've heard here. Now, you might say, no, I don't agree with you. You know, this word means this, this, that word means that. This is connected to this particular covenant. And so, no, I don't buy it. We all have to come to that place, don't we? But are you? Are you coming to any place? Are you getting down and saying, man, I'm going to study this. I'm, I'm not going to come up for air till I understand some of this. That's the kind of spirit Jesus blesses. We'll, we'll develop that too. But I want to hit you with this one. Probably the wrong word. Sorry if that sounded combative. <clears throat> Three. In, in love for King Jesus and submission to his authority, let us by faith in our wonderful Savior live in the light of baptism's truth. Well, you're probably not as sinful and forgetful as I am. Probably a lot nicer than I am. I often forget the great and glorious things God has done for me. And I'm thankful for when he reminds me. When it's joyful or when it hurts. But very often we don't live like baptized people. And this is what I want to leave you with this morning. Jesus wants you to live in the light of your baptism. What were you saying in that baptism? Well, let's think about it for just a minute. Can you handle a little bit longer? Children, you've been so good. I realize that I'm straining your patience. I'll do what I can to wrap this up pretty quickly. Our confession says baptism is an ordinance, and that means something established by God, of the New Testament, ordained by Jesus Christ to be unto the party baptized, a sign of his fellowship with him. Do you live in that? Do you live in the joy of knowing that when you were baptized, you were baptized into the fellowship of Christ? Jesus, the Son of God, the Holy One, the Pure One, the altogether lovely One. The one who loves to come into his garden and feast among the lilies. The one who loves to take us into his banquet house. The one who wants to unfold that banner of love over us. Fellowship with Jesus. Well, I'm busy. Got to hang out with my friends. Well, live in the light of your baptism. It means your fellowship with Jesus. It speaks of your glorious union with the King of Kings. You know somebody who's more powerful than anyone else you know. And it's Jesus. Is that where you take your heartaches? Is that where you take your broken dreams? Is that where you take your sin? Is that where you take every and anything in your life? You have fellowship with him. Your baptism says, in union with Jesus. You don't have anything better than that. Ordained by Jesus to be under the party baptized, a sign of his fellowship with him in his death and resurrection and is being engrafted into him. You are in a real union. You are in a, a, a truly spiritual, miraculous union with the living God. And that's, that's part of what that baptism is all about. He died. You die. He lives. You live. Live in that light. You're dead to what you were. Do you realize that? Well, I still wrestle with what I used to be. Oh, that might mean that you're alive. I'm serious. People get saved and they think, okay, well, everything's going to get wonderful. No, the Lord is going to start his building work on you and he's going to show you how much foul and hateful pride you drag around with you every day. He's going to show you that you can still lie. He's going to show you 
that you can be a contentious, grumpy person. He's going to show you, you. Why would he do that? So that you will cast your all on him. And when you cast yourself into his blessed arms, when you cast yourself on everything that he's done to save you from your sins, when you cast yourself in his arms and say, cleanse me again, he always does. He always does. Your baptism speaks of that. Live in the light of your baptism. We'll do the rest of that next week. I'm not going to cut it off. I'm going to quit. So let me say to you, the last few verses of Matthew's gospel are not just the, the end of his gospel. They're big and fat with glory, the glory of Christ, the glory of his love, the glory of his disciples, his tenderness, his goodness, his grace, his mercy, his love. That's why he's sending all these men out. All over the world, the nations are under Satan. I'm going to go start robbing him. Go. Go pluck him out of that country. Go pluck him out of that city. I've bound the strong man. Just preach my gospel. It's my power. Trust me. By the time it's all over, you'll be like me. When we get to the last day, I'm the model. Now let's live in the light of our baptism. We'll talk about that some more next week. God willing, if the Lord gives us next week, may we realize that as Jesus sends his people out to baptize, that's an important matter. He's branding his people everywhere and saying, this one's mine. This one's mine. This one identifies with me. Amen. Holy Jesus, what weak and feeble creatures we are. <clears throat> Father, I do pray for all those that have heard this morning that have not kept them from hearing thy truth. Oh God, thy spirit must take these things and move them in the, heart, the, the hearts of thy people. And for the lost, oh, go after them. Lord, bind them with the cords of love. Draw them to yourself. How glorious thou art. In Jesus' name, amen.